we don't. Hey everyone. Hey, Charles. <laughs> so um, I want to start by thanking everyone for tuning in to my talk today and wish everybody celebrating a happy Father's Day. Um, I think we're going to start with prayers. All right. As soon as they're up, I'll start. Oh, Lord, you gave no chung song. Pima ge shardom pola. Ya sin go ji go droop ne. Pema ju mi si su drag. Kor du kondro me kor. Ke ki jesso dig droop ki chinji lo chershik su so guru pi ma city hong hong or yul jin noob chung song pema ge sardong pola. Ya sin go ji nig droop ne pe ma jung mi shi su drag kor du ke dro ming po kor ke ki je sur dag droop ki chin ji lob shur shok su so. Pum guru pima city hong. Hong or you jing mi noob chong som. Pema gi sardong pola. Ya sin go ji noob droop ni. Pema jeg mi zi su drag. Kor du ki dro mong po kor. Ke ki jesso dig drub ki. Chin ji tin ji lop shar sing su so. Pi guru pi ma city hong. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, perfectly, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to, I pay, to you I pay homage, make offerings and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, 
to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. To you, who were wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector, to you I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you, who is free from dust, matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector, endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, field of ocean-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. <clears throat> from freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three ever devout homage, to all worthy of aspects, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha, like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, Drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning, and clouds look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of <clears throat> the all seeing and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the ways of aging, sickness, and death. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I'm enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity free from holding some close and others distant. <clears throat> Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I represent clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginning this time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until Sapsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen and may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. <clears throat> this offering I make of a precious jewel mandala together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech and mind O oh, my master, my yidams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion, 
Please send forth the waves of your blessings. Edam Guru Ratna Mandakalakam Niryatadami. <clears throat> the heart of the perfection, <clears throat> excuse me, of Wisdom Sutra. <clears throat> I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagavan was dwelling on mass of Vulture's Mountain uh, <clears throat> on uh, Rajariya together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitevara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, the venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitevara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? <clears throat> Kathy, are you doing okay? Yeah, I just, um, the page is, hasn't turned. I don't have my prayer book with me. Thank you. He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokitevara said this to the Venerable Shari Putra. Shari Putra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly, beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness. Without characteristics, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, <clears throat> not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object to touch, and no phenomenon. There is <clears throat> no eye element, and so on, and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on and up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, similarly there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no <clears throat> attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear, having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequal, the mantra that is thoroughly pacifies all suffering and should be known as the truth since it is not false. <clears throat> we'll say this 21 times. Taya gate gate paragate parvasam gate bodhisattva.
<clears throat> the Gati Gati Paragati Parasangati Bodhisattva. Shariputta, the Bodhisattvas, Mahasafas, Mah <clears throat> Mahasafas should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commended the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avlaka Chavara, saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that. It is like that one should practice the proud perfection of wisdom, just if you have indicated, even the Tathagatas rejoiced. The Bhagavan, having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivari Putra, the Mahasattva Arya Avlaka Chavara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagavan. <clears throat> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, so Today, my talk will focus on the first noble truth of suffering in the context of daily performance, aka um, going out into the real world and interacting with others, as well as seeing what arises inside of us. The four noble truths are facts which are seen as true by highly realized beings. The first noble truth is that of suffering. The second noble truth is that there is a true cause to suffering. And the third one is that there is a true cessation to suffering. The fourth noble truth presents us with eightfold path. Um, for the structure of this talk, I want this to be an open discussion. If anything arises with someone, if they have a question or a comment, please feel free to raise your hand and come into the conversation. So within the first noble truth, which we will focus on mainly today, um, divides suffering into three categories. The first of which is suffering of suffering. This refers to our unhappiness. So basically our unhappiness with difficult situations or unhappiness when we experience sickness or death. The second suffering is that of change, which relates to happiness. Happiness and joy is so beautiful, but we carry a lot of suffering with it because it just never satisfies us and we know that it will eventually go away. The third type of suffering is all pervasive suffering, which refers to samsara. I think we can all understand what suffering is and what it feels like and what it looks like. We can say it's poverty or it's war and we've seen clips of it on the news or maybe it's something like depression or some other painful experience that we've had. We all have different feelings and visions and different associations with what deep suffering feels like. But there's a true and bearable horror that comes with understanding that in samsara, Whatever pain arises inside of us when we think of suffering will happen to us again and again and again. Beyond that, I find it truly outstanding. Not only that we have this per like perspective anticipation that suffering is going to happen to us again and again and to who we love again and again, but that we've already suffered it time and time again. So just ignoring the concept of reincarnation and focusing on the repetitiveness of suffering in this lifetime how many times have we experienced sadness and despair or anger? We recognize it and we can identify it, but it continues to have such a hold on the mind and body. And it feels as if we're completely unprepared for it when it arises inside of us. Shifting the focus from negative feelings we feel over to our positive emotions, we still feel that that struggle of these positive feelings are fleeting. The Dharma identifies all pervasive suffering to be samsara. We die and we take rebirth uncontrollably and continuously. We feel this terrible pain and we see others in agony over and over again and we don't do anything. We've seen it all and like it's some kind of traumatic amnesia. We forget about it when we're reborn and we're so surprised by the suffering when we're confronted with it again. And why do we do that? So to preface, I haven't overcome suffering. Um, However, my journey with training and with practice has taken a very apparent turn into understanding how to experience suffering. There is a natural inclination that we have to resist suffering. We don't wanna die and we don't wanna watch others die. We cling and we grasp to our happy moments and memories with craving 
And we even turn to these happy memories to find some kind of solace when we're faced with hurt. I assume that everyone who's on this call, um, who turns to Vajrayana, who is on the path, decides to enter into a culture and faith that is so completely different from anything we've experienced in the West, does so because there is a sense of internal brokenness that anyone who walks through the doors of the temple or hops online carries a little bit of inherent sadness. I think that sadness is born from compassion, from knowing that there is something a little bit wrong and we're having this deep hunger for something else. I just don't see how you could take this path seriously otherwise, because curiosity can only take you so far. But even if I, like, as I say these words right now to you, there's something very contrary to them. Because we crave cyclic existence to end and we're a little broken, but it's contrary to liberation because without this sense of sadness, would you have decided to train and to meditate and spend your time here with me on a Sunday and talk about suffering? I don't really think so. So if that sense of hurt was one of the many reasons that brought you here, how could it be so bad? And the truth is wanting anything else besides what is happening right now in the present, no matter how bad it feels, is ultimately just feeding into the second category of suffering. Could we actually categorize brokenness as being broken when it's something that's made you whole? So we also have this idea that suffering is connected to redemption and that through suffering we can grow, but even that this notion still treats suffering as something like an aversion. You know, it's something that we have to deal with in order to grow. Throughout all these texts and sadhanas that we read, the Buddha is likened to a conqueror. The Buddha is the one who conquered his mind and in turn has given us the resources to conquer our own mind, to liberate ourselves and in turn to liberate others. When we think of a conqueror, we don't think of someone who runs away from a battle. We think of someone who is going in head first and methodically. The conqueror isn't foolish. They don't go seeking out a battle, but they go in and conquer what needs to be conquered. They go in face first and they go into the thick of it. And that's the exact relationship we must have with our own minds. We cannot turn away from pain or from mental illness or ignore suffering. And we can't be cowards when it comes to ourselves. Now, a misconception that I had for a while was that in order to conquer negative feelings meant that I had to get over them fast and to be positive for the sake of other people. But continuing down the path and studying with my teachers, I've come to realize that doing that really only rejects the human experience. We're born into this world as humans. We're born screaming and we're born crying into this world. And we learn about joy and love and things get deeper and they get more complicated. But we're still going to scream and cry. And I remember watching this documentary that discussed childbirth and the mother's in pain giving birth. But it's theorized that the baby is also in pain from coming out of the womb. So at this purely basic level, we're suffering and we're causing our mothers to suffer and we ourselves are suffering pain. And yet, in theory, we can understand that suffering is an inescapable part of life, but performing it is so much more difficult. Um, recently, I had a conversation with a dear friend and member of our Sangha, and we discussed struggling with mental health. She's someone who's really going through a difficult time. And she told me that in the past, she would resist crying and feeling sadness because she didn't want to let it spiral into letting it consume her and consume her day. But she realized that it was possible for her to embrace sadness when it arose during her day, allow it to exist and allow it to pass. And hearing how she was able to experience her mind in such a pure, natural and organic way resonated deeply with me. I'm sure that others have felt the desire to keep their feelings locked deep away and to stay stoic. But the truth is we do not allow ourselves to know the sentient being we are, interact with the most, which is ourselves. So last week I found myself in Darshan. Um, before I realized I was on schedule to do this talk, completely emotionally battered and drained. Um, usually I try to keep my sessions with Lamala structured, tell them how Shamatha is going, what practices I'm doing, what I've learned. But that day I just wasn't there. I felt deeply rejected by someone in my family who I love very much, and it completely shattered me. 
And when Lamala realized how deeply shaken I was from this incident, our time together became one of the most important teachings from him that I've had so far. I was kindly reminded of one of the most basic teachings, something we hear almost every day, that if we don't take care of ourselves and if we're not happy in the conventional world, our capacity to benefit others is greatly diminished. The problem wasn't that I was angry or sad or frustrated. The problem was that I didn't wanna feel angry or sad or frustrated. And by not allowing ourselves to experience what arises when confronted with suffering, we missed out on feeling that discomfort and from seeing and understanding the many different textures of life. I've come to understand recently that by accepting these negative emotions and by embracing them, there is a sense of rejoicing, no matter how dark it may feel. If I could put a narrative to that feeling of rejoicing that comes from pain, it's like, woo, I'm alive, I'm grateful, cool, but still sucks. Like, it's a bit re like reassuring, but it's also a little bit crazy. But as of late, it's added a different dimension to both training and performing in your life. Um, the thing with the Four Noble Truths is that they make perfect sense and are crystal clear in theory, but going out and confronting them in reality is so much harder. We know we have these hallmarks of compassion arise when we see someone in pain, when we see someone we love hurting, when we see someone on the side of the road with no money or food, and maybe we become angry when we see political or social injustice, but it's so deeply woven into the fabric of society that qualities such as stoicism and being strung out is something to strive for. As bodhisattvas, it's our true motivation to benefit all sentient beings but it can be quite difficult to lend our focus to being a benefit when we live in a society that rewards the product over the process. I was raised not to share what's going on on the inside and to work hard and to never stop working hard. I can't tell you how many times I've heard friends and coworkers discussing their sleep deprivation with a sense of pride or talk about their unhealthy eating habits as if it was something to be proud of to be high strung and stressed out and depressed. <laughs> But having gone through periods in my life where I lived like that, it's impossible to see anyone outside of yourself when you don't take care of the vessel you're born into. Um, I need to be completely transparent here and say I totally dreaded writing this talk. Um, the last one I gave, I was feeling good and positive and a little bit nervous, but it felt very joyful to reflect on my time in Nepal and my experiences with uh, Kangsar Rinpoche and the kids and I felt like my motivation there was very clear and that I wanted to share this experience with my song and my friends. But this time around didn't really, didn't really feel like that. Um, a lot of people around me are struggling and in the process of being on the cushion, being by myself and interacting in relationships. A lot of the time I was going through the motions of life and just having a darker outlook. Um, my apartment started getting messier, or I was sleeping a lot more, and I was okay putting a face on for others, but when it came to being alone, it was just very difficult. And on top of that, when I asked Lamala last week what I should write about, he encouraged me to write about suffering. So it's like being a wild animal backed into a corner. It's like, I'm, I'm dealing with all this stuff, and now you're making me write about it. Like, great, thanks. <laughs> so... At around 9.30 or so last night, I was just feeling stressed and worried, and I decided to call Rinpoche and tell him that I was suffering because I was writing about suffering. And to which he replied, um, you have this opportunity to share the Dharma, and it's really actually a blessing. Just stop it, basically. <laughs> and in all honesty, just hearing that really did sh like shift my perspective into remembering what my motivation is, and my motivation is to share something in my life with you. Um, my desire to do well and my desire to have an engaging discussion with you hasn't changed and the room didn't physically change and I didn't physically change, but this chaotic feeling I was struggling with subsided. Um, my motivation with having this discussion with you is that because I wanna share parts of myself that I struggle with and because I think it's a sangha we should all work to be more transparent and reveal ourselves without fear and judgment. And to do so means being truly honest with our inner world. So the great thing is that the Buddha gave us eightfold paths, the right view, intention, speech, action, livelihood, effort, concentration, and mindfulness. We're given a guide on how to liberate ourselves and others. 
So while suffering is inevitable, we do have the tools to work slowly and hard and liberate ourselves. So with that, I kind of just want to open the floor up to the discussion. No one has to suffer. Hi, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Hi, yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your talk. And I think, uh, yeah, I'm kind of right there with you. Um, and uh, one thing, one uh, I, that Tupin Chodron says a lot about um, suffering is just that kind of like everyday, like unsatisfactoriness, um, that kind of like malaise feeling where it's like, you can't find happiness or contentment. It's just this constant underlying, uh, just unsatisfactory. And it's not like extreme suffering, but it's what we kind of like deal with the everyday. And um, yeah, I felt like that's an interesting way to think about it too. Um, is that it's not always like this very obvious suffering. It's kind of just, it's, but it's always there, this like yeah. not being able to get content or feel content. So, yeah, I remember I think it was last week when Lamala said to um, work on transforming like these neutral moments into equanimity. And for the past week, I've been working on doing that. And that's really helped because I think right when you notice them, it's like this decision whether to become malaise or unsatisfied and instead just having a little little bit of an upturn to it. But I really love that you mentioned that. Thank you. Hey, hi, Jules. Hi. Kathy. Hey, Kathy. Um, great topic. Um, yeah, I've learned too, and and Lama and I've talked about this that, you know, even in the days when you're suffering a lot, whether it just be you know out of boredom or you don't like your job or you know, you're having a issue with a friend, there's always a space in there that you can find a little bit of relief. You know, there's that little pause. And I think if we kind of look for those little pauses that it kind of breaks it up and that gives us an opportunity to reflect on, you know, our path and what we're doing when we feel those little moments, you know, it's, it can, it might not be very long, but there's just little bits. And um, I found that to be really, really helpful when I start to notice that little empty pause. Sometimes when I'm really in the thick of hurting or, or just uh, so distracted that I'm not really focusing on what I should be focusing on. So, but great, great topic. Thank you for giving this talk. Thank you for sharing, Kathy. I actually have a question for you. Um, where do you think that pause comes from and why do you think it's so good for, for you to kind of stop there and think about it? Well, for me, I think I've learned the pause from my meditation and just the practice where, you know, even in my meditation, when I'm, you know, my mind is just all over and I'm really having a hard time bringing it back there's always just little bits of openness there where I, I go, oh, and then all of a sudden it goes off again. But for me, I don't think I ever really noticed them uh, until I started uh, working with Lama and doing serious meditation and reading the Dharma. Um, so when these moments occur that I usually I'll and just be thankful and just for an instant and then you know things start up start up again but i get a little bit of relief yeah it's really beautiful thank you for sharing i completely agree with you that the process of training it does get better hi jules oh. hey matthew am i cutting in line or is this okay um i think you're okay uh, I, or, I really like your talk. It's okay. I uh, I think Karen was. Oh, sorry. Karen, you know I'm not sure. Okay, I think she's waving her hands. As in Matthew, go first, and then we will go to Karen. I promise. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, I get. Yeah, I'm 
really excited about something you said. I actually had to write it down. You're talking about um, there's the first type of suffering, which is like just the, the suffering of existence. And then when we can't sit with that, then we create secondary suffering. And so sitting with our suffering is very meaningful. And what I think what you said was what we categorize as being broken is actually what makes us whole. And I find that to be a like really mind blowing statement um, in that when I feel broken, what I'm actually doing is experiencing the wholeness of being human and, and all that comes with it. And I know in, in my practice a lot lately, what I'm finding is um, I'll feel like Jack was talking about that uncomfortable malaise when like things are basically okay, but like, it's just kind of not a great feeling. And I really want to create a justification and a story around the not feeling some sort of, you know, positive descriptive emotion, you know, and, and constantly having to stop myself and be like, well, no, that's a story. Like, that's a story. I don't even know if this story is real. Like I'm creating, I'm creating. And I wondered if you could speak on that experience of, of internal storytelling. Oh, gosh. Okay, that's a little hard, but thank you for sharing your experience. That was really beautiful. But um, when it comes to internal storytelling, I find that's very important to recognize what narrative you're giving yourself and to be gentle about it. And um, honestly, sometimes sharing your like what you're going through and having a different perspective pushed on you by people you trust is also very helpful. Um, you know, it's just funny how that phone call last night with Rinpoche, how he said, you're, you're blessed to have this moment to share the Dharma that just completely turned off, like this chaos that I was feeling where I didn't really know what I was going to do. And I was just feeling stressed out and scared and I was anxious and didn't want to talk. Um, so that changed my narrative because I heard someone else giving it a different shift and kind of turning the sphere. So it's like, these internal emotions don't have to change necessarily, but we can look at it differently. Is this kind of what you're meaning, Matthew, or is there something else? Um, yeah, no, that's what I mean. I'm, I'm very curious about what people um, put into practice in those moments um, to be in a, to, to sit with those emotions without needing to storytell and what that means to um, allow it to process it. Yeah. I think what you said is also very important with um, feeling that gratitude during the process too. That's something that's also been very transformative for me, to me as well. I think for anybody, if you're just thankful for being here and for being alive and for having the opportunity to listen to the Dharma, that's huge. So you know, even if everything is falling apart and it hurts, you're still here and you're still experiencing it and it's still cool. Thank you, Jules. It Thank is you. Awesome. I think Karen. Karen and then Elizabeth. Okay. Yeah, I mean, maybe you just said it, Jules, but I, I thought I heard you say that when you sit, when you're with your emotions, when you just allow them to be there, um, and not do anything about them that you actually experience. I don't know if you said like a rejoicing or a joy or some kind of happiness. I had two questions about that. Of all, is that what you said? <laughs> and <laughs> second is, is, is that on the cushion? Are you able to do that on the fly when, you, when you're actually, you know, uh, in your daily routine? Actually, when I'm on the cushion and I'm not feeling it, like, I think it's been the past year or so where I've been okay not feeling good on the cushion. Otherwise, before I was like, oh, why are you sad? You have to focus. Like it was like actually way harder for me to deal with negative feelings on the cushion. Dealing with them in real life, it's a little bit easier for some reason. I think it's maybe it's a coping mechanism that I've learned, or mm -hmm. maybe it's just through doing shamatha and being able to have those pauses where you know we can feel a sense of joy and kind of feeling all right with experiencing a human feeling you know it's like we're not robots we're not anything other than ourselves and 
I mean, do you think, do you counter yourself and think that, you know, do you practice countering that? Because me, I get really kind of swept sometimes in my emotions. And so then I don't have, I don't see any break anywhere to, to, to use my brain to say, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> slow down, you know, just, just be there with it. Yeah. You know, I have, do you, do you have a thought or you just tra you've trained enough, you think with a lot of, of meditation to where you're getting to where you're, it kind of ha just happens. Um, you know, sometimes I'm good and it arises naturally. Other times I have to think about it, but other times I get swept away in the feeling and chaos and craziness of it. Um, I think everyone is susceptible to losing their centeredness and their peace, even enlightened beings, when you experience an emotion or a feeling that's so strong that you can't rejoice until it's over and you can't be okay with it until that feeling has subsided. And I recently had one of those feelings where it's just a few days ago, I just felt a little crazy. Couldn't really control myself. Like, yeah. and, um, you know, it was just a reflection that, you know, I'm, I'm still a person. I'm, I'm still capable of losing myself a little bit. Um, not even losing myself, just feeling sad and feeling upset. Like we can feel it and it's okay if that feeling doesn't arise right away. We can be rejoice, like rejoicing and grateful for it after it happened and reflect on it. Does that answer your question, Karen? Yeah. Yeah. No, I like, I like that. The way you've said, you've talked about that. That's helpful to me. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Elizabeth. Hey, Jules, I like your talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it really gave me a good idea. I, what is that? I will, Matthew was talking about your internal narration and I've had so much difficulty with um, the Four Noble Truths, the first one of suffering. Uh, the first time I encountered that, I was probably about 20, 22. And um, a friend of mine lived in a Dharma center. So I came to town to find a job. And so I got sort of immersed in this whole thing. And I thought to myself when I encountered the Four Noble Truths, it's a really bad marketing message. And I thought, you know, <laughs> this is such a noble uh, philosophy that there's, they've got to have a better marketing message because the right. truth of suffering is really, it is not attractive. And it really bothered me. And over the years, I've like rewritten billboards and uh, how could you couch this in a little more attractive way? And then once the person is enticed in, they could go, oh, wow. Oh, yeah, that's true. Oh, that's true. Rather than there is suffering. Fuck. That is just <laughs> not attractive. So for years and years and years, this really bothered me. And over the last couple of years, I wrote a stand up comedy about reconfiguring <laughs> the Buddha's Four Noble Truths. Well, the last three are not too bad, but the first one is just hard to overcome. And actually listening to your talk, it gave me a really good idea about how I can <laughs> fix it. <laughs> so I can complete it. Anyway, it was just, um, thank you. It was really fun. And that's my internal narrative with the Four Noble Truths. So there are a wide variety of internal nar narratives for the Four Noble Truths. <laughs> You know, it's like, I remember um, when we took refuge, like realizing that we were taking refuge, not only to liberate ourselves, but everybody else. And I remember like having a moment afterwards, where I was like, I have to do this for everybody I don't like. And like all of these were like, what, what did I do? Ugh. And it's like, <laughs> it's that same type of feeling. It's just kind of like, we have to confront, like, like go into it. Like we know, like we know we're gonna suffer but it's like like seeing it on paper just like it's just a little bit um I don't know it's just there's a little bit of discomfort with accepting that and it's okay well you can't right? casual you can't casually sit down in a conversation and say there's suffering let's you know I'm going to talk about that your friends look at you and go no no there's shopping <laughs> no there's movies <laughs> No, there's marketing. <laughs> yeah. 
Maybe. I don't know. I, I feel like it's okay to talk about suffering every once in a while. I mean, we're doing it now on a holiday. <laughs> Oh, does Jack want to come in? Yeah, I just wanted to quick comment on um, what Karen was saying and like sitting with, you know, feelings and whatnot. Um, one thing Lama did tell me, and this was when I was having like a lot of experiences of like, um, like kind of traumatic feelings like around situations that I've experienced or that families experienced. And he said it was important for me to not sit in that like kind of masochistically, like you don't want to be Buddhist masochist. Like, so if like those kind of like traumatic feelings come up um, to like really give yourself care and love first and to not force yourself to re-experience and re-traumatize yourself. Um, so I felt like that was a really important distinction and it like allows us to okay give ourselves care and compassion and then check and see if we're ready to engage with that experience um so yeah just a little little side note that's beautiful Jack thank you yeah. Brad Jürgen. oh uh Bradley Jürgen yeah hi Jules thanks for your talk today um, I, I really struggle with being transparent and it's it's uh, um, it's great to see somebody else get up and just be open and and talk from the heart. You know, and I, I when I was listening to your talk, I was just amazed at thinking about how much denial I can be in, you know, and just like I do my meditation practice and I'm thinking about all these topics and then I get up and I just live my day without thinking about anything. And I think that it just shows how deep the denial and the, and also the distraction. It's so easy to just find some distraction that um, that I use, you know, kind of unconsciously to to not pay attention to the stuff that's going on. And so, you know, it's really nice to hear your talk and to kind of be reminded of that. And and thanks. Thank you, Bradley. I appreciate you sharing that. And I think the fact that you can recognize that there's denial and distraction is um, it's a really big deal, and it's very um it's a it's a bigger step than I, I think you know and um when it comes to being transparent it's not something at all I'm okay with um you know I, I grew up just like ingrained like you do not share things with people just don't share your weaknesses you don't share what you're going through you just keep it to yourself and there's almost like this responsibility to be happy and to be positive and to not let anybody know that you're going through something but it's like I remember um last week when I was really in the thick of it and confronting what I was going through, I, I started telling people I was around what happened and people were like, oh, that happened to me too. And that just kind of like, it, it took away a part of that feeling away because it's not, it's not my own issue anymore. Someone else also experienced that issue. And in a way it just kind of moved it from like the internal pain to understand that this is like, this is a more dynamic issue. This is something we're all going through. And I think as a Sangha, we need to welcome and be open with those feelings. And actually, Bradley, I found your talk on the Lom Rim and talking about what you were going through. I found that incredibly beautiful and actually very transparent. It really inspired me to actually be more open about what I'm going through and to try to tell other people what's happening. So thank you for that. Hi. Um, hey, Susan. Good morning. Uh, let me turn my microphone around. Is that better? Yeah. Um, good. Okay. Um, you know. I guess I'm, I'm thinking that whenever I've done, you know, thinking or contemplating or reading about the Four Noble Truths, I always seem to see them taught and I understand them as pairs. It's, it's as 
two, two sets. You know, there's the truth of suffering and its causes and that one can be liberated from suffering and there is a path. So it's, it's, so I have a hard time just talking about suffering without, without some sort of relation to where it's coming from. And, and as you said, you know, there's, there's all of these different types of suffering, but then there's causes. And so, so anyway, I, it's just a comment that I just, I just, um, I can't, I can't like compartmentalize it that way. Um, and the other thing, and you just touched on it, um, is that when I'm really deeply, uh, or just even, you know, superficially feeling really in touch with, 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 of hurting about something or worried about something or, you know, some mundane type of suffering that's going on all the time, that there is a connection with everybody else because everybody else worries too. And everybody else um, feels a, a wrench in their gut when they walk past, you know, um, someone experiencing homelessness and is in really, really bad shape on the street corner. You know, there's a wrench in your gut when you walk past that and everybody feels that, you know. Not everybody. <laughs> there are some terrible people in the world, not everybody, I would say. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not Almost sure people. that I, that, that, that I agree with that, but in any case, um, so, so the suffering, I find a connection and you mentioned it also. So, and, and I don't know, I just can't separate it to be a standalone thing. It isn't a standalone thing for me. It's, it's, there is a cause for it. There is a, it has a, a it's either suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, pervasive suffering, something I'm not getting, something I want, something, you know, there, there's, there's a reason for it. There's something going on and it's tied to one of the poisons, right? So I just, I really have a hard time separating it out that way as it's a standalone thing. And I see it as a, th a connective thing as well. So anyway, just to make I think they can be both. You know, I, I can definitely say that I also writing this out, I did have a little bit of a hard time understanding how to just focus it on this one topic and not bleed into cessation or look for something like it's gonna transform and it's gonna end up being so positive because that's not really the reality of it. Um, this book I'm reading actually by the Dalai Lama, uh, I brought it with me, it's called The Stages of Meditation. There's a part in the book where he talks about sentient beings and using your practice and training as an inference point. So for me and thinking and reading that quote and thinking about what I was gonna talk about here today, I was thinking more to structure it towards seeing the self as an inference point. That's something that Lama has taught me many times because you know, you're know you stuck with yourself. You are gonna be the most important practice object <laughs> at the end of the day and what you experience other beings experience and that is the path to stopping it. Does that make sense, Susan? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your comment. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So, do we have any last comments or questions, concerns, criticisms? Okay, I think we can go on to prayers. And thank you for everybody for coming on and participating in discussions. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for suffering with me. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. <clears throat> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, May I quickly attain the state of Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into the enlightened state. 
May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise <clears throat> and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land in, encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chenrezig Tenzugatsu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish. May the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Abulika Chivara, please, <clears throat> great treasure of op objectless compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Long Song Drapa, may I request, make request at your holy feet. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was great to see all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Jules. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Jules. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Jules. Thank you. See you, Doug. <laughs>